This video is powered by patrons. See the link in the description and learn how you can support videos like this. Son. Desmond knows just what to do. His fellow assassins Rebecca, Sean and now his father William know where it has to be done. They were given the coordinates by the ones who came before. They have guided them here to Turin, a small village outside of New York, USA, to enter this grand temple. They hope a place where they can stop the impending catastrophe. This cataclysmic event. The ones who came before ultimately succumbed to an event like this thousands of years prior. They see Desmond as humanity's only hope for it to not happen again. The date prophesized for this apocalypse is December 21st, 2012. They have 52 days. Let's go. The apple, taken from the vault under the Colosseum, opens the ancient doors. The same apple that Juno worked through to stop it getting into Templar hands. Abstergo's hope was to use it for their satellite launch. Now, not to be. The apple was needed for this purpose. Another artifact found on the temple floor turns on the lights, but there is something missing. Something they need to access the inner chamber. Within it, they can understand how they, how Desmond, can save humanity. Juno is here to help them. The key. You must find the key. <sighs> here we go again. This is the fifth instalment in my ongoing story summary of the entire Assassin's Creed franchise, and you can watch the previous four in the playlist below. I'm the Patient Wolf, and I'm a Let's Player and storyteller who is discovering and understanding the fascinating lore of this franchise in real time. Playing the games blind on my Let's Play channel, Patient Plays, creating story recaps and other lore videos here on my main channel, The Patient Wolf, and you can take this journey with me. Subscribe and hit the bell to be informed of the next videos. Head over to Patient Plays to enjoy detailed playthroughs as I discover the game, and if you would like to support the time it takes to complete this journey, you can do so over on Patreon, where patrons get to watch all videos well in advance and ad-free. I'm The Patient Wolf, and this is the story of Assassin's Creed 3. Desmond has travelled the ages, visiting his ancestors in his time with the Animus. He has been to the time of the Crusades with Altair. He has seen Renaissance Italy with Ezio. And now, here in the temple, as his friends and father place his unconscious body under the rapture of the bleeding effect into Rebecca's newly updated Animus, he is to experience the life of this man. His name is Connor. This is a story about family, about loss, hatred, revenge, duty, struggle and sacrifice, but perhaps mostly for Connor, it's about belonging. But we're not ready for his story yet. To find the key to the inner chamber, Desmond needs to go back a little further, across the Atlantic, to London. It's 1754. Invitation, please. Who is this man? He finds his target like an assassin. He scales the walls of the opera house like one, and he bears his hidden blade in a way Desmond has seen so many times. This assassin is here for something, just like Desmond. Here for the key. This is what they need. This man is Haytham Kenway, and he returns his prize to his fellow assassins and his master, Reginald Birch. They too search for the temple, fascinated by the knowledge of this lost civilization. I hold in my hand a key, and if this book is to be believed, it will open the doors of a storehouse built by those who came before. Whatever waits behind those doors shall prove a great boon to us all. Or our enemies, should they find it first. They don't know what Desmond knows, but they were on the trail. A trail that became lost. Why? They know the temple lies on the east coast of America. And that is why we've called you here, Master Kenway. We'd like for you to travel to America, locate the storehouse, and take possession of its contents. Upon this paper are the names of five men sympathetic to our cause. We've booked you passage to Boston. Your ship leaves at dawn. Go forth, Haytham, and bring honor to us all. 
On the cusp of his 30th year, Haytham Kenway arrives in Boston on his brotherhood's search for the Grand Temple. Boston, in the middle of the 18th century, at the very start of the Seven Years' War. America, colonized by over two million Britons and far less French. The French compete in the war between them by rallying Native Americans to their cause. In Boston, in 1754, Haytham arrives to a city controlled by British redcoats. There is relative peace. Trade exists in the ports, but with a war brewing, poverty and discontent is on the rise. Please! Someone stop him! Haytham Kenway has a job to do, and a list of names in which to help him. One of those names is waiting at the port. Charles Lee, sir. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Charles has been given leave from the British Army to help Haytham set up his team. An order sent over from London, the Brotherhood there. Has reach. I had hoped that I might study under you. If I am to serve the order, I can imagine no better mentor than yourself. Charles is not part of their order yet, but admires and aligns with what they stand for. He is keen to impress Haytham. Oh, no need, sir. I've arranged for your bags to be delivered to the inn. That inn is the Green Dragon Tavern, and it will be the headquarters for all the work Haytham and his team will undertake in the coming years. With the help of Charles Lee, they begin to gather those names. William Johnson, a man with great knowledge of the surrounding lands and native people living within it. Thomas Hickey, a strong pair of hands with his ear to the ground of the criminal underworld. Benjamin Church, he's a finder and a fixer. And a doctor with a broad knowledge of the city. And finally, John Pitcairn. He will prove difficult to recruit. He currently serves the British soldiers, his commander, Edward Braddock. Braddock and Haytham share a history. They served their orders as brothers, but... Edward was one of us upon a time, and I considered him a close friend. But everything changed at the siege of Bergen op Zoom. He killed and killed. He maintained that violence was a more efficient solution. It became his mantra, and it broke my heart. Braddock is the same commander that Charles Lee serves, currently released to help Haytham. It's Charles Lee's connections that gets them in the barracks where Pitcairn is currently installed. Haytham, General Braddock. It's bad enough my superiors have insisted. I grant you use of Charles, but they've said nothing about this traitor. You'll not have him. Denied but not deterred, Haytham and Charles later ambush a patrol containing Pitcairn. They get their man to the disdain of Braddock. Traitor! Go on then! Join them on their fool's errand! I stay my hand today because you were once my brother. Or should our paths ever cross again? All debts will be forgotten. Haytham has his team. He now sets about tapping their strengths. We believe there's a precursor site in the region. I require your knowledge of the land and its people to find it. In his business pursuits, Johnson has long had dealings with the local native tribespeople. And when he sees Haytham's artifact, he immediately makes a connection. It appears Kanyan Gahaga in origin. Can you trace it to a specific location? I need to know where it came from. Johnson lacks this knowledge, but the Kanyan Kahaka tribe may know more. This is not information they will give freely, especially to the British. We'll need to earn their trust before they'll share what they know. There may be a way. Hickey hears rumour. Men moonlighting among the British are kidnapping and enslaving the native people. Freeing those captured while slaying the man in charge may go some way to earning that trust. Benjamin Church knows just the man capable of such an endeavour. A British soldier named Silas Thatcher. A crueler and more vicious creature I've never known. Their plan is simple. Disguise themselves, gain entry under guise of ferrying newly captured natives and shut down the operation for good. But as Haytham takes his place at the helm of the slaver's carriage, his focus on the task wavers. One of the captured slaves is this woman. We're here to help you, along with those held inside Southgate Fort. Free me. Not until we're inside the gate. Using the woman and her tribespeople as cover, they enact their plan. Oh. Delivery for Silas. The slaver's ring destroyed, the captives liberated. See, I'm freeing you just as I said I would. Now, if you'll allow me to explain. It is clear to Haytham that the trust they seek will take time. Who is this woman and how has such a brief encounter made him feel this way? He must see her again, for his order's sake as well as his own. It would be months before Charles Lee finds a lead. 
Word is she's been stirring up trouble just outside the city in a town called Lexington. Haytham uses his innate skills passed down through the ages to track this elusive woman. I come in peace. What do you want? Well, your name, for one. I'm Gadzi Zio. God, God's day. Just call me Zio. With her name just as complex as the feelings in his heart, he plainly gets to the point. She recognizes the artifact immediately. I've only seen such markings in one other place. She is still reticent to share. Look, I am not the enemy. There is more Zio can gain from this man than just her freedom. That town hosts soldiers who seek to drive my people from these lands. They're led by a man known as the Bulldog. Edward Braddock. You know him? He is no friend of mine. Haytham spared Braddock once through nostalgia, but his death will now pay for something far greater. Ridding this threat to Zio's people will earn the trust needed to learn of this sacred place. Braddock's death is the key. But first, we have to find him. It would take time, time spent together, gaining intel, putting plans in place. Their connection grew. That wasn't necessary, but thank you. We should move on. They have a plan. They know where he'll be, why he'll be there, and when. We will ambush him here near the river. Go and gather your allies. I will do the same. It would be five months before their plan would come to fruition. But with the assassins and their allies assembled, it was time to sabotage Braddock's expedition. He plans to take Fort Duquesne from the French. Everything all right, sir? Amongst his officers is a young, ambitious George Washington. Just savoring the moment. The French will leave, or they will die. Braddock's moment would be dashed. They are ambushed en route, and amongst the chaos, the assassins strike. In a red coat disguise, Haytham gets his chance. Your death opens a door. It's nothing personal. Well, maybe it is a little personal. But we are brothers in arms. Once, perhaps. All those innocents slaughtered, and for what? Whether we applied the sword more liberally and more often, the world would be a better place. Haytham gives him the assassin blade, but takes a ring. They were once brothers, but even within brotherhoods, method and purpose sometimes fail to align. Haytham sees this as a cleansing and strips him of his life and his place in the order. Zio's trust has now been earned, and she takes Haytham to the sacred site where the symbols match the amulet. Will this key open a door? The artifact glows, as do the ancient symbols on the walls, but the key is not the right one. No. No! This room is all there is. I expected more. What do they mean? It tells the story of Yotzitzizu. Her eyes still watch over us. Her ears still hear our words, her hands still guide us, and her love still gives us strength. I... I should go. With his heart unlocked, and with the door to the answers he sought closed to him, he returns to his brotherhood to regroup. We need to redouble our efforts and expand our order. It is time to recognize one of their own. Just as the recruits of times past are inducted, it is time for a ceremony. He has proven himself a loyal disciple and served unerringly since the day he came to us. Initially teased privately for being a sycophant, overeager, too keen to please, the assassins have accepted him and it is vital to their success he becomes a permanent member. Then we welcome you into our fold, brother. To Desmond, the ceremony had perhaps changed throughout the ages. The Levantine assassins sacrificed a finger. The assassins of Italy saw fit only to brand their loyalty. Give me your hand. Now here, in Boston, this fledgling brotherhood of the Americas opted only for a ring. But Desmond did not recognize the tone of the ceremony. It did not chime with those he'd seen before. The rhetoric was off. Something was not right. Together, we will usher in the dawn of a new world. One defined by purpose and order. You are a Templar. Wait, what? May the Father of Understanding guide us. Desmond's ancestry had included a Templar. There were signs, obvious to him now, but he had not the time to feel duped by time. After all, they knew who had the key. 
they must follow its trail. But to do this, they must follow the DNA. Not only did Haytham earn Zio's trust, he also earned her love. And in reciprocating that love, they spent a stolen spell together, which they knew could not last. They stepped away from both of their worlds for a moment and for a short time created their own in the wilderness. But unbeknownst to Haytham, Zio returned to her world bearing his child. The lineage had passed from father to son. To follow the trail of the key, Desmond must now live the memories of Ratuna Gaiden. Desmond, you need to keep going. But in the Grand Temple, Desmond struggled with his more immediate lineage. Desmond left the assassin order he was born into at 16. He was captured by the Templars and used. Since escaping, he has spent little time outside the service of his cause, the cause for a time he felt his father imposed upon him. I'm sick of being a goddamn pawn. I thought it might be different with you. I mean, you're my father, but it turns out you're no better than the fucking Templars. <sighs> Maybe I pushed a little too hard, asked a little too much, but try and remember exactly what's at stake here. The emotional disconnection, the one that turned him from his family, from his cause, still exists. But since the moment he entered the Animus, he has seen firsthand the cause of the assassins through the ages, the oppression of the Templars and the gravity of the impending catastrophe. He does not need to have the cause imposed upon him by anyone anymore. He knows what he must do. This is his cause. Within the Animus, he must follow the key, but within the Temple, they also have a problem. They need to find more sources of power like Desmond first found in the temple. In order to power the temple sufficiently, to gain access to the inner chambers, they need more. This task lies on Sean's shoulders. I intend to tiptoe into the Abstergo database. Now, if I can cross-reference these particular devices with their database, then maybe we'll get lucky. The ones who came before led them to this temple. The spectre of Juno seems to be present. She appears sporadically urging the assassins to keep going to unlock the secrets within. Do you think it's a recording or is she a ghost? But I can't shake the feeling we're being watched. I don't know why they had to make this all so complicated. I mean, if they need something from me, they should just come out and say it. Throughout Desmond's journey, he's met this triad of characters, Juno, Minerva, Jupiter, inside the Sync Nexus, but never collectively. I get the sense Juno and Minerva didn't exactly see eye to eye, but maybe you'll find something down here that can shed light on the mystery. What happened between them and why? Desmond doesn't need coaxing from Juno. He enters the Animus, a new ancestor beckons. Ratuna Gaiden had his father's eyes. He was told this, he'd never met him. Despite being a child of two worlds, he was loved by his tribe. Their village was in the heart of the Mohawk Valley. Despite the importance of the valley as a route to the frontier by colonists, they still kept their lands. Choosing not to fight with the French during the Seven Years' War, now over. Looking to stay impartial, hoping to be ignored, the village was near that cave. Those symbols, they saw it as part of their culture to protect its mysteries. Radunogerdun's mother, Zio, the daughter of the clan mother, traded that mystery. She loved Haytham once, but she knew him and feared that Haytham's darkness, his lust for control, would rear itself in her son. But at this age, she just saw a playful, curious child and did her best to create a safe and loving world for him. On the day her child went out to the valley to play, that world ended. What have we here? You look familiar. Where have I seen you before? We have questions for your elders. Only tell us where your village is, boy, and you can go. For Desmond, this is not the quiet, helpful, unassuming Charles Lee he had seen through the eyes of Haytham. This was a man with the eyes of hate. He meant harm to the Mohawk people. Ratuna Gerdun would never tell. You are nothing, a speck of dust. You and all your ilk. But I am not unkind. Let them know the sooner we are given what we seek, the sooner you can return to your pathetic, empty lives. What is your name? <laughs> Charles Lee. Why do you ask? So I can find you. Awakening from the Black, 
But Dunageddon rushes back to the place he feels safest. He hadn't seen a white man before. These people with desire and disdain in their eyes. Despite his outward bravery, he had never been so scared in his life. If he were to describe evil, what he saw in the eyes of this man would be it. Yeah! And that evil had found his village. The men didn't need his help to find it. It was a blaze burning in the name of ambition and greed. He had one thought, his mother. They say, to raise a child takes a village, and this village rebuilt. Raised with Dunageddon, with love, the clan mother, his grandmother, loved him and knew there was a plan for him. Nine years later, he was 13. His loss was still with him, but he had grown strong. He climbed. He hunted better than anyone his age, better than his best friend, Canon Dorgan. But he never leaves him behind. He does his best to elevate his peers. The valley is still a paradise to them with all the bounties they would ever need, but more and more colonists have been seen, and it's only a matter of time before they settle here, forcing his tribe out. They gather special items for a ceremony called by the clan mother. Ratunagerdun has no idea what awaits him. The crowds part. The clan mother knows it's time for him to understand his destiny. Why they do not wander like the other tribes. Why they hide from the conflict brewing in their lands. For they have a purpose that transcends this, to protect what is sacred. The clan mother presents the artifact that has been entrusted to them through the ages, a piece of Eden. Its purpose is to deliver a message to one individual, to show what might be and what might be changed. <laughs> On touching the artifact, Raduna Gerdun is transported to the Nexus. Greetings, Guardian. Juno. You who will bring to him the last piece, that he may open the door. I do not understand. Nor need you. In the form of an eagle, the Nexus takes him through the probability of time. How a malevolent group planned to seize their lands, destroy their sanctuary. Juno explains his special lineage. Many who have changed the world, who will change the world, so too shall you. He and his people know it only as the sanctuary. They'll never know it as the temple and what it holds within it. He knows only that he is chosen to save his people to protect this site. For if the men with evil in their eyes enter it too soon, it will mean the end. Ratunagerdun must save his home and his people at all costs. He must then retrieve the key. What am I to do? You will learn of a man who will provide additional training. Seek this symbol. As he emerges from the Nexus, he scrambles to remember the symbol. It is his first breadcrumb. The clan mother knows it well. Once upon a time, her daughter, his mother, sought help from this same man. He lies to the east. It is 1769, and at 13, he will leave the Mohawk Valley for the first time and enter the frontier. He feared what lay ahead, but knew the fate of his people if he chose inaction. He will find this man, and after days of travel, he does, at the homestead described by the clan mother. What? I, I was told you could train me. No. This is not the outcome he had rehearsed during those miles through the frontier, but there was no question of him giving up. The homestead was grand, but it used to be grander. It had clearly been neglected in its structure and surroundings. He used its ramshackle stables to rest and shelter, persisting daily, meeting the same outcome. Get the hell off my land! He would not, not even when the skills he wished to learn were used against him. You ah. <clears throat> stay this course, and the only thing you're gonna be is dead. Fear had never been a deterrent for a Dunagadon. The world's moved on, boy. Best you do too. He licked his wounds in the stables. You will train me. 
You have to. His chance to break through to the old man would arrive in the form of bandits. Here to strip the homestead of further value. But the Nagerdans' fighting skills are instinctive but rough. The man could see this. Oh. Thank you. Clean this up. Then I suppose we should talk. This is Achilles Davenport. Like the house he hides within, he is old, broken and past his best. Like Raduna Gerdon, he is a man of different colour to the European colonists who brought their entitlement, greed and oppression to this land. He once defended himself and others against this. Mentor of the colonial order of assassins, but both the brotherhood and his will was broken and collapsed. He did not know it, but inviting Raduna Gerdon in, he had invited in hope. Hope? he thought was lost forever. Who are you? My name is Rado Hangado. Right. Well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. I was told to seek this symbol. The spirit said that, that I am- These spirits of yours have been harassing the assassins for centuries, ever since Ezio uncorked the bottle. Uh, but you don't even know what an assassin is, do you? Over the course of that long evening and into the night, Raduna Gerdon found out about the history of the Brotherhood, the Templars, the ones who came before and about his lineage. Painful truths like his father, Haytham, the leader of the Templars, will stand in the way of his ultimate mission. To save his people, to protect their secret, he is and has the key to all of this. He also remembers those eyes. Charles Lee is a Templar, and now an enemy in more ways than one. The man responsible for his mother's death. They have to die, don't they? All of them, even my father. If they succeed, your spirit's visions will become reality. Come on, I have something to show you. Huh. I don't think you can just come in here, throw those on, and call yourself an assassin. I, I did not. I, I would never presume... Before that, he needs to prepare himself for everything that is to come. What he sought comes to pass. Achilles spends the next weeks, months, indeed years training him. His body and his mind sculpting him into the beginnings of an assassin. He is exposed to history, philosophy, politics and how to kill. While feeding Redunagedon the wisdom he needs, he is also fed life into himself. He sees a future he did not care to fathom before, and with that, a care to improve the house, the homestead around him, to make a home instead of a prison. The closest city, Boston, has some of the supplies needed to do this. Raduna Gerdon sees the beauty, bedlam, and bureaucracy of the big city of Boston for the first time. He is awed by it. There is so much life here, so many opportunities. For a few, my boy. He also learns its dangers and how to avert the gaze of the redcoats, to blend in and divert and also how to get around the city fast and undetected. Achilles explains the change that is starting to brew in these new lands. The British spent big in their seven years war against the French. Their efforts to tax the colonists to pay for it are met with disdain. There is talk of revolution, but will that also be for the few? Maybe it is this change in the air that prompts Achilles to suggest a change for Raduna Gerdon. You're also going to need a new name. Your skin is fair enough that you might pass for one with uh, Spanish or Italian blood. What would you call me then? Achilles knows instinctively. Connor. Yes, that will be your name. So Connor has a new name. Home, a new life, and a mentor. His mother once worried that he may inherit some of his father's nature. But our nature reacts to the movements and mentors around us. Connor absorbs and adopts the assassin philosophy with all his heart, perhaps never to be wavered or broken. In all his fibre, he is a guardian, as Juno called him. He would choose to guard the freedom of all those denied it, denied by men like his father. The biggest lesson he was to learn that went against his nature is patience. He knows he needs to spend time absorbing everything he can if he's to stand up to the skills of his father. It's not until 1773, his 17th birthday, that both he and Achilles believe he can begin his fight. If you're going to stand a chance against the Templars, 
You're going to need these. And this? Put them on. You've your tools and training, your targets and goals, and now you have your title. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Connor. He is now ready to take the fight to Charles Lee, to the Templars, to his father. Back in the temple, Sean's hunt has borne fruit. I've managed to locate a power source, and it's relatively close by. A short drive to Manhattan, but there's a catch. I think we're better off having you drop in from above. What do you mean, above? Desmond parachutes from the adjacent building to the Abstergo office below. It's too easy. The artifact is on display in a corner office. Did Abstergo even know what they had? That wasn't so bad. So, you must be Desmond. Who are you? Ask your father. I'm not supposed to kill you. But the boss man didn't say anything about fucking you up. So you got to the camp. Oh. Abstergo had tracked them, but Desmond has the artifact, and on returning to the temple, the assassins filled Desmond in on this mystery Templar. So who the hell is Daniel Cross? Believe it or not, he used to be an assassin. It turned out he was a sleeper agent for Abstergo, programmed to infiltrate and destroy the organization. Cross is a dangerous asset to Warren Vidic and the Templars. His volatility, his mental state has been exacerbated by extended periods in the Animus. They must be wary of him. Abstergo know what the assassins search for, and they are tracking them. They need two more power sources which Sean will track down, all the while avoiding Daniel Cross and the cross he represents. Desmond focuses again on the key. In the four years since Connor had been at the homestead, he had seen great change in both himself and the people of this land. The British were losing their grip on America and something new was brewing. But underneath this, the assassins sensed strings were being pulled by the Templars for their own ends. He saw this in Boston, as Charles Lee's gunshot lit the touch paper of discontent outside the Boston Custom House. He saw the satisfaction in his father's face as lives were lost and hatreds galvanised. They want power. If not through the British, then they look to place themselves somewhere in this emerging regime. Connor must determine where, but where to start. It will start with Connor on the back foot. His childhood friend, Canon Dorgan, delivers news of the British looking to force them from their lands. They said that the land was being sold and that the Confederacy had consented. Do you have a name? He is called William Johnson. At this moment, he resides somewhere in Boston, preparing for the purchase of the land. Connor must defend the tribe he still feels so much a part of. Achilles knows who can help draw out William Johnson. Connor finds Samuel Adams, a member of the Sons of Liberty. Samuel Adams, at your service. Adams has discerned that William Johnson is funding the purchase of the land by smuggling and selling British tea from the ships at the docks. A stage requires a spectacle, and I may know the play. The play is twofold. The Sons of Liberty get to send a message to England, and you rob William Johnson of his financing. Your village will be saved. On December 16th, Connor leads the Sons of Liberty in raiding the ships, fighting back the British and dumping the tea profit center of both the British and William Johnson into the harbor waters. The village has been saved for now, but America will never be the same again. The revolution has officially begun. The threat to the village is stemmed, but the Templar threat is still ever present. You should have killed him. There was no need. Time will tell if you speak the truth. Connor took no pleasure in killing, but if it stands in the way of liberty, he would do so in a heartbeat. He pledged his blade to the people, liberating areas of the city from the hands of oppressors and recruiting those that would aid in this endeavor. Wherever he could help, he gave back power to the people so they could live in freedom. He saw a way of life away from control and greed. Indeed, he looked to create that ideal in his new home. Surrounding the house, the homestead boasted bountiful land. Too long had it languished untended. He encouraged a community with people who did not fit in in the wider world. He invited them to stay and put their skills towards this ideal. Our village is growing and in need of all forms of trade. Just business and a new life. People who just wanted to contribute 
farmers, carpenters, hunters, clothes makers, doctors, priests and publicans. The homestead was its own ecosystem and thrived. What resources they did not need themselves they sold. The proceeds fed back into the community and into the fight. Below the homestead, its harbour was rejuvenated and within it, pride of place, docked the famed assassin's ship, the Aquila. Now restored to its former glory. Why, the Aquila boy, the ghost of the North Seas. Captained by the oft inebriated Robert Faulkner. She'll fetch 12 knots in a stiff gale, ne'er a ship from here to Singapore can outrun her on her best day. What do you say we take her out and show you what she can do first hand? As Connor does in the cities, he does so on the high seas, seeing to the Templar threat wherever it lies. Victory for the Aquila! For her glory! Hip, hip, hurrah! Adventure on the waves also brought mystery, as he tracked treasures in far-flung seas. A local character that frequented the harbour kept letters left by William Kidd, the famed sailor and pirate who a hundred years before Connor looked to keep artefacts from the hands of the Templars. Connor found the artefact he looked to protect. This Shard of Eden would help Connor in his fight with the Templars. A precursor device to help shield its wearer from projectiles. Each time he ventured to the horizon, he always returned to the bosom of his adopted family. He will always be Canyon Kahaka, but this is the world he hopes he can help create in the whole of America, where people respect difference, embrace cooperation and love one another because of it. It's while basking in the glow of his creation that Achilles' warning becomes a reality. William Johnson has returned with all the money required to buy our land. He meets with the elders as we speak. If Connor stayed his blade once, he would not do so again. Achilles is right, they will not stop. The elders try to resist. We are not here to negotiate, nor to sell. We are here to tell you and yours to leave these lands. Perhaps you'll respond better to the sword. Connor does not hesitate. Like many Templars of the past, even in death, their convictions remain. I could have saved you all. You speak of salvation, but you were killing them. Because they would not listen. And so, it seems, neither will you. William Johnson believes the colonists will turn on the Mohawks in time, but for now they remain. On his body is revealed information on his next target, John Pitcairn. John Pitcairn has risen to command level within the British Army, and his orders are to target Patriot weapons and supplies to stem the flow of the revolution. The Templars care not where they assume power. At this moment, they have placed themselves in both camps in order to have total influence. But topple Pitcairn, and Connor rids the world of a Templar and tips the scales towards the resistance. Connor can't do it alone. He joins the Sons of Liberty in helping gather the Patriots to the cause. The British are coming! And stands beside them in defending the town of Concord as Pitcairn looks to take those Patriot weapons Hold and supplies. Fall back! Fall back! We did it! They're turning tail! Connor helped aid the cause of the Patriots but failed to further his own. I should have struck when I had the chance. It would be weeks before he had another. He meets Samuel Adams at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The Patriots are gaining strength, becoming organized. The new Continental Army elects a leader, George Washington. An ambitious individual, he did not find the advancement prospects he desired within the British Army, and he left for politics. A decade after the French-Indian War, he finds himself at the spearhead in the revolution for independence, to the vexation of one man. Truly, there as is pay, no man better sir, suited to the task. To assure really? the Congress that I can no think of several. Charles Lee. This Do I know you? I Come, Connor, there's someone I want you to meet. Charles Lee won't recognize that scared young boy in the face of Connor, but Charles Lee's face is seared in Connor's memory. It was Lee that killed his mother. Here, Charles Lee has been passed over for this command, a blow for the Templars. What a boon it would have been to be at the very top of this emerging power. An independent United States is close to a reality. The Templars need to grasp the reins. For Connor, Lee must wait. The grasp of the British is loosening. 
and it is near Bunker Hill that Connor gets his chance to meet Pitcairn. He fights his way through the British to end his life. Like so many Templar last words that have occurred before, their aim is that of peace, but method is the difference between them. And I would have succeeded had you let me play my part. Part of the puppeteer. For better we hold the strings on another. No, the strings should be severed. All should be free. And it's on his dying body that Connor discovers the next Templar plan, to assassinate Washington and place Charles Lee as his obvious successor. The man charged with completing the task is another name on the assassin wall, Thomas Hickey. Connor heads to New York. Thomas Hickey runs a counterfeiting ring in the city. Connor looks to shut it down and take Hickey out of action. Oh. Oh, I ain't supposed to be none of your kind left. Suppose I'd best be rectifying that then. Get him! Connor is not the only one looking for the counterfeiters. You are both under arrest! Oh. The Patriots have shut down the ring. What are the charges? Counterfeiting! I had nothing to do with that. Listen, there are more important things at stake here. This man is planning to- ah. He awakes imprisoned, and with only the bars separating them, he gets closer to his father than he ever has before. Thank you kindly for the rescue, gents. There can be no further mistakes, Thomas. Am I understood? What about this, the assassin? Deal with this, Charles. At once, sir. Haytham knows who Connor is. He was unaware at the time that he had a child, and he is not known for long, but he knows. He will not meet his eyes. Lee remains. They were unaware of the rise of the assassins here on American shores until now. They capitulated long ago with Achilles. Your meddling in the revolution has caused us no small measure of grief. It cannot continue. Our work is too important. The child in the forest was you. You know, all of this might have been avoided had you only done what I asked. What does he mean? I think I have an idea. Yes, two birds with one stone. That idea is to frame Connor for the murder of the prison warden and accuse him of the plot to kill George Washington. While Washington looks over the gallows to see his plotter hanged, the Templars will complete their plan. But as Connor approaches the noose, he sees the assassin order he has rebuilt with Achilles come to his aid. He knows not which of them severed the rope, but he is free. Free to stop Thomas Hickey and end the plot. Go! Thomas Hickey was a faithful servant to the Templars, but his reason for service was not as grand as some. They has the money, they has the power. That's the reason I threw him with them. That's the only reason you are just some blind fool who's always chasing butterflies, whereas I'm the type of guy who likes to have a beer in one hand and a tea in the other. Connor's purpose stretches further. The plot scuppered for now, he joins Washington in Philadelphia for a pivotal moment for their country. They officially declare independence. The British are all but finished. The months draw on without event. Despite the inevitable impending return of the Templars, it is quiet. Connor travels to the Continental Army's encampment at Valley Forge. He can help Washington and possibly the assassin cause as well. Supply caravans meant for the camp have gone missing. I suspect treachery. A traitor named Benjamin Church recently released from prison has vanished as well. The two events are surely related. Connor investigates reports on the Southern Road. Benjamin Church is an enemy of the Patriots, passing information to the British, but he also has other enemies. Connor hopes to find sign of Church here, but instead has a meeting he has long rehearsed in his head. Oh, father, Connor. Any last words? Come to check up on Church? Make sure he'd stolen enough for your British brothers? Benjamin Church is no brother of mine. Haytham sees the man his child has become without his influence. He is awash with emotions, pride, envy, possibly even hatred, but he sees opportunity and a dovetail of purpose. To seek revenge on the traitor Church and subconsciously the chance to know the child he sired. Perhaps some time together might do us good. You are my son after all, and might still be saved from your ignorance. Connor's silence speaks to an agreement. Excellent. Shall we be off? Their accord lasted the following weeks. As they tracked a weak trail through the snows of the frontier, the burnt out shells of the Great Fire, and bustling Docklands of New York. Speed, Connor! 
We need more speed! Culminating in a sea voyage to the Caribbean, where Church looked to profit from his theft of Patriot supplies. Throughout their partnership, they found common ground, but just as many differences as has been held between Assassin and Templar for centuries. Order, purpose, direction. It's your lot that means to confound with this nonsense talk of freedom. But they stuck for now to their common ground. Haytham did not know his father well. He lost him at a young age, but he settled into a shorthand with Connor, although one of critique. You could have killed me when we first met. What stayed your hand? Curiosity. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like me to come along and hold your hand, perhaps? Provide kind words of encouragement? It's almost as though you want him to escape. You do it. Why me? Because I said so. Now go. How is it you came to captain a ship, given the way you say? It was at least resemblant of a father's love for his son. You I recognize, not the savage. He is my son. But bubbling under this is Connor's resentment he has always held for his father, the Templars, Charles Lee. I found my mother burning alive. Charles Lee is responsible for her death by your order. It's impossible. I gave no such order. It is done, and I'm all out of forgiveness. Further discussion may jeopardize Connor's immediate mission. They must find church, and they do so on the Caribbean Sea. They board the ship, and take their prize. Enough! Where are the supplies you stole? Go to hell. Connor aims to understand the mind of Benjamin Church. Like Braddock, he had drifted from his order. It's all a matter of perspective. There is no single path through life that's right and fair and does no harm. Dedicated as you are to fighting Templars, who themselves see their work as just. Connor understands this. He always has. Good people do bad things out of ignorance and fear. But he fights for what he thinks, knows is right, and he will not see people controlled, manipulated, oppressed. He fights for freedom, and he is wary of the mindset of the Patriots. Do they have everyone's freedom in mind? And like his father hopes of him, he hopes Haytham can be saved from his ideologies. Their work together is not done. They return with the stolen supplies. Both Assassin and Templar want rid of the Crown. In order to defeat them, they must know their plans. They capture British officers to find out. They are to march on New York. When do they begin? Two days from now. I must warn Washington. They head to Valley Forge. We should be sharing what we know with Lee, not Washington. You seem to think I favor him, but my enemy is a notion, not a nation. You oppose tyranny, injustice. These are just symptoms. Their true cause is human weakness. You have said much, yes, but you have shown me nothing. Then we'll have to remedy that then, won't we? As Connor delivers news of the British attack, Haytham finds just the evidence to deliver the revelation he has kept to himself for now. And what's this? Private correspondence. Oh, of course it is. Would you like to know what it says, Connor? Washington. The Patriots are due to attack a native village. Reacting to intel that they are working with the British against them, Washington's orders are to burn the village, salt the land, eradicate its people. The village in question is Connors. Not the first time either. Tell them what you did 14 years ago. Since that day, the day he lost his mother, he blamed the Templars for her death, Charles Lee specifically. But it was another. During the Seven Years' War, as the natives worked with the French, it was Washington's orders to stop this threat at any cost. Washington orders his village to burn, and he does so again. And so now you see what happens to this great man when under duress. He makes excuses and does a great many things, in fact, except take responsibility! Enough! Connor knows there are many minds and many moving parts to a collective greed. Washington is guilty. Yes, but he has his village to save. Not to save his nation, but to enact a notion. Connor is an assassin, and he stands for those that struggle to stand for themselves. He realizes he can't forge peace on such disparate ideals of how to live. He must do this alone. A warning to you both. Choose to follow me or oppose me, and I will kill you. Connor rides for his village. As Charles Lee lit the touch paper before the massacre at Boston, he does so here, 
the Templars have sculpted the perfect scenario. They have forewarned the village of the Patriot attack. They will see the British fall under a preemptive strike from the natives, and in doing so, Charles Lee will see the certain death of the natives he so despises. Connor tries to head off the Mohawk attack. He must stop it. He must save the village. He subdues who he can until he meets his childhood friend, his brother, Canon Dorgan. Charles Lee had spread lies to manipulate the village, that Connor wants the end of the village, that he has been corrupted. The hate and the betrayal that this has engendered is unassailable. <laughs> Connor has no choice. Another of those he loves has to die due to greed. Charles Lee is acting like every powerful Templar before him. He is pulling the strings and manipulating the tide of change on both sides. His plan has always been to weaken the British while at the same time undermine the leadership of George Washington. Lee wants the seat of power in this new world. Lee does such during the Battle of Monmouth. Connor aids the Patriot victory despite Lee's tactics. Charles Lee has betrayed you. He forced retreat in the midst of battle, hoping the loss would take the lives of your men and see you relieved of your command. What? That man is your enemy and he will not stop until you are dead or dishonored. Should you choose to spare Lee's life, then I will take it myself. Enjoy your victory, Commander. It will be the last I deliver you. Connor hates Washington. He has every right to, but at least his leadership is free of Templar grandeur, and at least he is steering the country towards revolution. He no longer needs to guide this ship. It will reach his destination of its own accord. They will get their independence. Charles Lee is the only person who can stop it. Connor knows what he must do. In order to open the door, and gain access to whatever is in there, whatever the ones that came before needs Desmond to get to. The assassins must have Haytham's artifact, but before then, they need the power sources. The first one Desmond found switched the lights on. The second taken from Manhattan store movement behind the door. Sean hacked into the database and found news of more. They traveled to Brazil to find a third artifact. Just like in New York, Daniel Cross was there to scupper them. Desmond narrowly escaped with the prize. News of the fourth and final artifact came from Egypt. Desmond needed to concentrate on Haytham's amulet. William would step up to the plate and retrieve it from the museum there. Desmond woke from the animus to hear the news. Abstergo has your dad. Where? Italy. Same place they were holding you. And the man holding him is familiar to Desmond too. Hello again, Mr. Miles. Warren Vidic, the man that kept him prisoner, forced him into the Animus, turned Lucy Stillman to his will, and now has his father. I propose a trade. Bring me the apple, and I'll return your father to you, no worse for the wear. Desmond knows William would want them to move on, find another power source, focus on the mission, but despite their differences, the parental missteps, the misconnection, he loves his father. There is no question what he must do. They leave for Italy with the apple, the apple left by Ezio beneath the Colosseum that opened the door to the Grand Temple, the apple that holds so much power. They know I'm here, Rebecca. There's no way they don't. Subdue the subject, please. Desmond doesn't need to be shown. He knows exactly where to begin, where it all started. But Warren Vidic's pet, his best soldier, stands in his way. Give me the apple. All right, Desmond, game's over. Not now, not now. What the hell was that? That was Cross's adult brain. Too long spent in the animus in the care of Abstergo, the care of Warren Vidic, so close to the apple held by Desmond. It triggered the bleeding effect. Kill the bastard, and then drink me the apple. Cross was no longer a threat. He could not defend himself. Where's Vidic? Fifth floor. Please don't kill me. I'll let you in. Desmond has the apple, but he has no intention of handing it over. You want it? Fine. Here it is. Wait! No! He knows how to wield it. It was meant for him left for him. After all, he's had the practice. 
He has his father. They have the final power source and Desmond has the apple. With the three power sources in hand, Desmond begins to bring the temple back online. When doing so, the ever-present Juno tells stories. Stories of the ones that came before and their failure to stop the sun. Four towers would be built to pull her fury into this place and dispel it. They did not have the time. The first tower was only partially completed and the project was abandoned. But while we labored on other endeavors, a few returned. They thought to automate the process. Metal might finish what flesh could not. They tried to use their existing shield technology to perhaps shield the earth, but they could not scale it enough. They looked to harness the power of the apple, the phenomenon that multiple minds harnessed to it could change the very fabric of reality. Their aim was to place the apple in the atmosphere to do this, just as modern day Abstergo hoped to do. Once placed, a sentence would be uttered, make us safe. But they could not control it. Minerva took charge of a divination project to enact a future solution. They created a device so complex as to predict the infinite possibilities of the future, enough so they could communicate with future allies. That device was called the Eye, but every future they predicted led to the same outcome, the destruction of the world. They turned to bioengineering, Juno's project, to change their genetic makeup to resist the effects of the cataclysm. In this manner, we might thrive in a world made poisonous. Juno's husband, Aita, volunteered to test the process. He was consumed with pain. He begged for the end. I pleaded with him to give us time to find another way. But, but there, there wasn't, wasn't one. Not, not for him, him. Not, not for us. us. Juno could see their race's fate was sealed, for their bodies at least. But what if they could save their minds? What if they could transfer it to another vessel, one more sturdy, like stone? For this, they found a way. It proved easy enough to enter, but to leave required something more, something wrong. And so this too they abandoned. I wondered though, were they right to turn away? However Juno is communicating with the assassins now, it's clear that before her kind passed, she suffered great pain. Somehow, she is even able to communicate with us digitally, hacking the emails and leaving written diatribes of her disdain for the human race, who are inferior, animalistic, wretched things. A hatred that is familiar to Desmond. He has seen it through the ages, none more so than with Charles Lee, and his similar disdain for the natives and those that oppose the Templars. In one email, Juno describes how she lost her father to human hands during humanity's revolution. In the temple, there is no Minerva, no Jupiter, just Juno. It is clear she has no love for humanity. Why is she helping them? Whatever's on the other side of that door, it benefits Juno. We need to be careful. The temple is now powered. They just need the key. Home stretch, Desmond. I can feel it. Haytham has that key, but he is nowhere to be found. Connor still hopes to spare him, to make him see sense. But in the homestead, his other father, his mentor that gave him the strength to fight, his strength is waning. Connor, he's asking for you. Washington spared Lee's life. So long as he lives, all are in danger. The same is true for your father. But with Lee gone, my father might... Listen to me. Both men must die. Connor leaves the ailing Achilles to construct his plan. Lee currently takes refuge in Fort George in New York. Connor can't enter from the ground. He will use the underground system to gain access and with the help from his allies, who will cause distraction at range from the sea. In the chaos, I will slip inside, find Charles Lee and silence him forever. Connor infiltrates. The guns rage. The bells ring out. He continues to the heart of the fort. Where are you, Charles? Gone. Uh, come now. You cannot hope to match me, Connor. Uh, give me Lee! Impossible. He uh, is the promise of a better future. 
Haytham knows he cannot turn the tide in Connor's mind. Connor knows the same. There was a time for Haytham, but that time is long gone. He is too old, too buried in the work he has done, in the lives he has taken, in the cause he has championed. Lee must live to see this world thrive under Templar ideals. He is their best chance. He does not hope to best his son. Maybe he will. He just needs to stand in his way. We did not harm your people. Ah, we did not support the crown. We worked to see this land united and at peace under our rule. Ah, ah. Surrender and I will spare you. Brave words from a man about to die. We require no creed, no indoctrination by desperate old men. All we need is that the world be as it is. And this is why the Templars will never be destroyed. Haytham has the upper hand, but he knows the assassins. He knows where they wear their hidden blades. He wears one himself. To truly give the Templars the world, all he has to do is use it. But who he is? The life he has lived, the product of that stolen summer with Zeo at his mercy. He won't. He leaves his son's blade arm free. He has given Lee the chance to flee. It's up to him now. And it's up to Connor. I will not weep and wonder what might have been. I'm sure you understand. What might have been is a story unto itself. As a young boy, Haytham was leading a different path until that path was diverted for him. Not unlike the relationship he had with Connor, not unlike the relationship William has with Desmond, Haytham's father was cold, distant, but intent on instilling skills and a mindset. His father was an assassin, and before he could impart that wisdom, he was killed, unbeknownst to Haytham by a man he would come to know well. That man would become his mentor and his master. He was a Templar named Reginald Birch. Before Haytham found out the truth, Birch trained him, taught him the Templar mindset and inducted him. He lived a life he was born to despise, a Templar life. Around the time Zio was having his son, Haytham acted on the knowledge that Birch was his father's killer and took his life. Revenge was its only outcome. Haytham now was who he was. He was a Templar and he still longed for a world under its ideology. Over the preceding years, he would wrestle with this. After so long trying to unite his opposing thoughts inherent from his father and the Templar life he has led, sick of being pulled in opposing directions, now, here, he accepts the world as it is. He accepts who he is. He accepts who his son is. Like Haytham's father, Connor was an assassin. Connor's grandfather's name was Edward Kenway. His story is yet to be told. We've got a problem. Haytham doesn't have the amulet anymore. Before bidding Lee to flee, before facing his son, allowing Charles to escape, he gave him the amulet. Charles Lee now leads the Templar Order, and Connor must track him down and face him. Like his father, Connor has been pulled in myriad directions. Is he Canyon Kahaka, American, patriot, homestead owner, assassin? Like his father, he must remember who he truly is, a guardian of those oppressed. I cannot afford to be consumed with doubt. The people need me. Now more than ever, I must stop the Templars. I will kill Charles Lee. Connor knows he will find him at the memorial service for his father. Connor knows the Templars know he'll be there. He doesn't care. He needs to face his enemy. I will kill you, Connor. This I swear. Not here, though. Not today. First, I'll destroy all you hold dear. I'll burn that homestead of yours to the ground and roast the severed heads of your precious founding fathers in its flames. You can try, Charles. But as with all your schemes, this too will end in failure. Take him away. He knew Charles would not strike here. He knew when held, the Templars could not keep him for long. He knew that his presence would unsettle Charles and he knew despite his threats, his defiant eyes would strike fear into Charles Lee. Connor would just need to wait for his moment and with patience, it came. Charles's time in the Americas has come to an end. The threat of Connor's next move is too much for him. 
he knows he is no match. Lee is at the harbour booking passage from these shores. Connor's there to meet him. He gives chase through the harbour into the shipyard. Why do you persist? You try so hard, but it always ends the same. Yet you fight. You resist. Why? Because no one else will. His midriff punctured, blood loss clouding his vision, he will not be stopped. He winged Lee. Connor tracks him up the Charles River to Monmouth, to the Last Drink Tavern. So long has he waited for this moment. Charles Lee was not responsible for his mother's death like he thought, but his leadership of the Templars have been and will be responsible for so much more pain in the world. This is not for Connor. This is for the people he protects. Charles Lee knows this is the end of the line. There is nothing else to be said. Connor finally has the amulet, the key to the Grand Temple. The task set him by the spirit all those years ago has been completed. Recovered from his wounds, Connor returns to the village. His endeavours were meant to save it, to keep his people here, unopposed by the changes outside the valley. But the village has moved on without him, headed west to delay the inevitable. All that is left is the door to the Nexus, to Juno. Now you must hide it where none shall think to look, and then in time, what once was, shall be again. I do not understand. Nor need you. But what of my people? You have saved this place, as was your people's purpose, and that matters most. Remember, you must hide the amulet where none might find it. Connor started out all those years ago on a journey to save his people, but his people have gone. The independence, the freedom he helped the Patriots attain has been achieved, but not for all. Although the Templars are beaten for now, his fight is not over. Not until freedom prevails for everyone. Raduna Gerdun is an assassin, but in the homestead, by the community he built, he's known as Connor. This is the world he hopes to see multiplied across the land, where peace, laughter, and unity prevail where people share success, share problems, and work together for peace. Not a nation, but a notion. This is where Connor belongs. When Connor arrived, it was a shell that housed a broken man. He was once a great assassin. He was once a happy family man. His story we may yet hear more of, but for now, the house, the lands, they are repaired, and that broken man found hope again. Achilles. As Achilles sat in his chair for the last time, he could be happy that the cause he fought for for so long would be in good hands. The hands he helped shape. In the young native boy, Achilles saw hope. So much so, he gave him a name very dear to his heart. The name he gave to the little boy he lost years before. He lost everything the day he lost his family. But in Connor, he glimpsed a future. The community they built together gathered round as they buried the old man on the hill. I will make you proud, old man. And it is here that Connor will hide the amulet at the request of the spirit. Guarded by the grave of his namesake, Achilles' infant son Connor and his wife, and Achilles, a family, at rest on the hill overlooking the community that has been born. And that is where the assassins in 2012 find it. Guess this is it. We're right behind you. They make their way to the door, to the inner sanctum of the Grand Temple. Moment of truth. With his assassins behind him, his friends, his family, he meets Juno at the altar of what he hopes is humanity's savior. Here, at last. You know our story now of how we tried, 
of how we failed, all our hopes extinguished, save one. One of their ideas to repel the sun was to do so with the construction of four towers to absorb the sun. Time allowed them to barely complete one. Although abandoning the project, they left the job to machines. They automated the project. It took centuries, long after the ones that came before had succumbed. The machines finished their work. To activate it, needed just one thing. Your touch, a spark, a spark to save the world. Wait, do not touch the pedestal. Minerva? Minerva, returning as a projection to warn Desmond. You, but how? You left! You destroyed the device! Did you think there was only one? You must not free her. Free her? One of the projects the Triad abandoned was that of Transcendence, rehousing consciousness to another vessel. Juno resurrected this technology and moved her mind to the very fabric of this temple, waiting for the moment she could be freed. Juno's priority was not to save the world from the sun. While we worked to save the world, she sought instead to conquer it. She used our machines to set her plans in motion. The eye that Minerva built to divine the future was appropriated by Juno, to use it for her own ends, to deliver a message to Desmond in the Colosseum, to kill Lucy Stillman. When we discovered her treachery, we put a stop to it. And then we left. But first we called to you. To Desmond and the assassins to come to the temple to try where they had failed. Minerva wanted to save humanity in the future, even if she could not save her own species. With the message sent, she destroyed the eye in the temple, but there was another, kept safe by Minerva, used to project to this moment. Now I see we were deceived. She survived, she endured, and then she began to work. After the temple was sealed, she transferred her consciousness to the temple, to the first civilization computational hardware within it, to be immortal but trapped. Whatever her plan was before her treachery was discovered, she now had thousands of years, and the power of the temple to communicate through the pieces of Eden scattered throughout the world to communicate with humanity through time. The tribe of the Mohawk Valley, Subject 16, with Desmond, to formulate a new plan to free herself and set about conquering the Earth. Her message to Desmond in the temple under the Colosseum as he stepped towards Lucy, blade drawn, was cryptic. It is done. The way lies all before you. Only she remains to be found. Awaken the Sixth. In the Grand Temple, as Desmond placed those power sources, Juno talked of six methods the first civilization attempted to save the world. The sixth of those she described was transcendence. She was saved, but trapped by the sixth method and she needed to be free, to be awakened. What she needed was a spark. Desmond's high concentration of first civilization DNA, the touch from him would activate the towers, the towers that took so long to build. They would absorb the sun's power, saving the world, but somehow transferring Juno to another vessel, one in which she can leave these walls, seek the power she craves, and an opportunity to punish, enslave the species she so despises. Minerva's message to the assassins is that it's too late. In touching the pedestal, the catastrophe may be averted, but a worse catastrophe would take its place. Only touch the pedestal and the world will be saved. Better the world burn than she be loosed upon it. Is that so? Show him then. Minerva long ago divined what would happen when the sun's rays hit. The world would burn. Its people would perish save a lucky few. The few, people like Desmond and his fellow assassins, safe underground, protected. When they emerged, Desmond would become a leader amongst them, inspiring unity to rebuild, to be at one with each other in peace. That word would spread and take seed, but in time, like all great leaders, his body would fail. Those words would be taken and corrupted and the cycle of humanity's failings would begin again. So tell me, how is this better? They will enslave your kind, Desmond. Is this not why you fight? Is this not why you came here? To ensure more than just your race's future, but its freedom? What future? What freedom? 
Billions dead, and the whole cycle begun anew? Enough! You must not do this. Whatever Juno's planning, however terrible it might seem today, we'll find a way to stop it. But the alternative, what you want, there's no hope there. It's done, Minerva. The decision's made. Save the world, but free a tyrant. That is the decision. Desmond will not wipe the slate clean, killing billions. However bleak the state of the world, however terrible the things to come, there are still assassins out in the world that will dedicate their lives to changing it, to freeing it, to stopping those that look to oppress it. You need to go, all of you, now. Get as far away from here as you can, son. In his time in the temple, Desmond achieved something he never thought he would. He became his father's son again. Desmond is the world's saviour, but his father and his fellow assassins will be its hope. They must live on. It's already started. I need to do this now. So go. Go! Desmond is not the boy he was that fled from the farm all those years ago. He ran from a cause he felt was not his. His father knew he was special, so wanted him to be prepared. Abstergo knew he was special and slaved him to the Animus. The ones that came before knew he was special and pulled all the strings for him to be here before the pedestal. But he was no longer anyone's puppet. This was his cause, his choice. And in touching the pedestal, he would give humanity a chance, however small, to be free. It is done. The world is saved. You played your part well, Desmond. But now, now it's time that I played mine. To be continued. Thank you for watching the fifth instalment of my Assassin's Creed story summary series. Make sure you are subscribed and hit the bell to be informed of the next video coming very soon. A like on the video would help it immensely and if you would like to see the next video two weeks before anyone else ad free, consider supporting my work on Patreon. And if you'd like to watch me discover these games in real time, you can watch my blind playthroughs of every game over on my Let's Play channel, Patient Plays, where you can watch me discover the next instalment, Black Flag, right now. I'm the Patient Wolf, and this has been the story summary of Assassin's Creed 3.